How's everyone doing? And welcome to the AGT Network YouTube exclusive. I am joined by an amazing actor by the name of Patrick Latour. I I spelt that said it wrong. I'm sorry, Pat. <laughs> it's a personal nightmare. Laberto. <laughs> Laberto. That is what French. Uh huh. Yeah, it's Cajun or they the the somebody made it up in in Louisiana. When we went to Paris, even the Parisians couldn't say it and just hated us for it. So, Okay. So you are a child actor that basically you went into regular acting instead of as soon as you grew older, you stopped acting. No, I'm still acting. I'm no, never I'm saying you still acting. are, but I'm saying most child actors, when they hit a certain age, they stop. You continued right. your career going forward. Exactly. Yeah, I was very lucky. I think what happens with young actors is it's basically a change of product, right? It's sort of like um, if you look at Arnold Schwarzenegger now, he doesn't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger looked like in the 80s, but, you know, it's like he's still Arnold Schwarzenegger. If you're a kid you know, like Macaulay Culkin, and then you grow up, you're not the same looking product. You're not the same looking kid. Arnold's not the same product as he was in the 80s. And so for a kid, it's a lot more difficult because you really don't have the same connection. You know, you can still see Arnold from the 80s in Arnold now. You can still see it there. But for kids, it's so difficult. You know, they grow up and they, they just look like a completely different product. Correct. And you actually were adopted as a, a child mm -hmm. into a um, family that is in the business. Right. My mom was a comedian. She used to travel with the Tommy Dorsey band uh, with a comedy act. And then she met my dad and then she settled down. They adopted two kids, my brother and I, who are separate biologically. And then my dad later on, when my mom wasn't getting any work, then later on he became an agent to like and opened up an agency where he kind of like ran an agency mainly to get my mom jobs, but then ended up discovering like a lot of great talent. Um, the guy from uh, uh, the Goldbergs, the the dad on there is is right. one of our old clients that you know my dad discovered in a comedy club. Nice. Now, your earliest acting is actually on The Little House on the Prairie. True. My, that's my, the earliest TV show. The earliest acting, I guess, I did, I did a couple of different guest stars here and there. I was in a movie called Blazing Saddles and a movie called Maine with Lucille Ball. And that was before Little House, but they were very, very quick. And in the case of Blazing Saddles, I was completely cut out. I'm only in one shot of that movie now. But for Little House, yeah, it was. I, I did. I think some something like uh, forty episodes of Little House, and so I worked on that a couple of years. Now I know Little House on the Prairie is one of the most popular TV shows from the seventies. Um, do you still keep in touch with anybody from Little House on the Prairie? I literally just two minutes before we got online here, I got an email from Pam Roylands, who played Sarah Carter. And, uh, and yeah, absolutely, absolutely keep in touch with people. I know there's a big, huge reunion, I believe, coming up this year. That's exactly what the email was about. Everyone's putting their best foot forward. We're going to be doing a bunch of different events over the year, but the big, big main one is in Simi Valley, and that's going to happen at the end of next month in March. And it's, I think, going to be kind of special where everyone's going to get together You'll be able to meet the cast, you know, signed autographs. They're taking people in buses up to the Simi Valley location where we shot it. And even though all of the buildings there were removed when we finished the show, they've rebuilt the facades up on the locations where they were so you can get a sense of exactly what the place looked like. And then they're recreating the interiors of some of the sets down back at the base camp where you can walk around and see what it looked like from the inside. It's pretty spectacular. Nice. Now, compared to going for a interview or audition now, how were you able to do the auditions back then? 
That's a great question, man. You know, I just I just had an audition for a new show with um oh what's it? Ethan Hawk. Ethan Hawk is doing a new TV show. And I just got an audition to audition for it. And so what happens now is <clears throat> literally where I am right here, this camera, these lights, all this stuff. Uh I do the audition, I read the lines, I pretend I'm speaking to a person off camera here, I record it, and then I send it over to them via an email. Back in the day, and this was <clears throat> even up until like COVID, you would get a call from your agent, not an email. You would talk to your agent, not an email. And they would say, we got an audition for you. You'd go to an address, you'd look at the script, You'd work on the material and you'd talk to a real life casting director in the room. You'd have a conversation. Maybe you'd laugh together. Maybe you'd, you know, it was just a real in-person type of thing. And it's completely the opposite now. I'm sitting here alone in a room auditioning for a job and there's no personal interaction. It's really, it sucks. And so that's, that's a huge difference right there. Because for Little House... I was replacing the kid who played Andy Garvey on Little House uh, at the first. And I don't know why they didn't want him to continue, but they needed to find an Andy Garvey very quickly. So uh, the story I tell is on Wednesday, I watched an episode of Little House. On Thursday, I get picked up from school and taken to Paramount uh, from my mom uh, with my mom. I auditioned for Susie Sukman, who is the casting director for Little House in her office at Paramount. She says, hold on, I'd like you to read for Michael Landon. They take me from Paramount off to Simi Valley where they're shooting, about an hour and a half drive. I walk down a hill and there's Michael Landon. I read for Michael Landon. There's a couple other kids that came with us that also read. Michael Landon says, yes, you're the guy. And I got into wardrobe that night. And on Friday morning, I'm working on Little House on the Prairie with Melissa Gilbert and Melissa Sue Anderson and I'm being attacked by these wolves. So it happened so incredibly quickly. And it was all in person. You know, it wasn't it wasn't online like this. So it was a different time. How was it working on Little House on the Prairie with the kids and then the adults? Were they more of a parent to you guys or separated themselves once filming was done for the day? It was a very, uh, not a lot of people when they talk about acting, they go, oh, our, our set is like a family. Well, here on Little House, there were real families. Michael had his kids be extras in the show. My brother and I were on the show at the same time. There were a pair of sisters that was playing Carrie. There was Melissa, who was related, whose brother played Willie. And so there were all these people that were literally related to each other. So the adults were all super friendly and they would hang out on the set. This was before phones. So you'd have a chair and you'd have maybe a book or a puzzle or a backgammon game. And you would just hang out waiting to shoot. It was, a, it was again, a real different time. And they would treat us like children because that's what we were. But they were, everyone was really caring. You know, and, and the story I tell about, you know, Merlin, who played my dad, Merlin Olson, my dad was really, my real dad was really, really ill. And so Merlin was like a second father to me. Not that he, <laughs> not that he wanted that. I mean, he was very nice about it. He, he acted all the things that you needed to do to take care of a kid who was like, you know, looking for a dad because my dad was really, you know, not, not doing well. And so on that level, he was literally like, you know, my, my paw on the TV show and, and kind of acting like a dad off camera. Um, but yeah, even, even Mrs. Olson, who can be crazy on the show was sweet and, you know, kind. Um, but yeah, it was, it was more of a family show on the <laughs> shooting it than it even was watching it. Okay. Also too, as a child actor, you guys still have to go to school like normal. Right. How is it different to the way they do the schooling now to back then when you had to go through it? You know, actually, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if there's any difference. I do know that we had to do three hours a day of school and you could bank 
school time. So like, let's say you're doing a, an episode and you're in it, but you're not really working all, all day long every day. So you, you would do your regular schooling and then you could bank an hour or two. You could continue doing school so that the next day when they needed you for a lot of things, you'd already got two hours of it in and you could withdraw that time. And it was kind of like a credit system where you could, you know, bank the school for later. Uh, I don't know if they still do that, if that's still legal. Um, it made sense. You were still getting the schooling. Um, and to be honest, it was the better schooling, the best schooling I ever got, because you've got one tutor for, you know, a couple, six or seven kids at the most. And in fact, we had two teachers, one for the younger kids, one for the older kids. And these were really good teachers. In fact, my teacher on Little House was the same teacher that they had for Wesley Crusher on Star Trek. So it's like, it, it's just good teachers okay. teaching teaching the kids. And they were also acting as our social worker in the sense of like, they were the eyes of the state of California to make sure that we were being taken care of, to make sure that we were broke the proper times for food and meals and, and all of that. And where would you actually do your schooling? Right there on the set in say a trailer or would you go to a special building? Uh, excellent question. When we used to shoot at, uh, at Paramount, and then when we moved from Paramount, they moved us to uh, Stage 15 over at MGM Studios. And when they moved us there, they built, um, along with all the other sets, in one corner of the area, they built a bunch of different uh, dressing rooms. And it was like a hallway of dressing rooms. And at the end of the hallway, they had built like a little school area. So when we were on those sets, we did it in literally the school room. Um, when we were doing it for uh, outside on location, any place that was cool, because Simi Valley was always very hot. And the, the place where we actually went to school in the show, it was a shell. There was nothing in there. But, so we couldn't do any schooling in there. But we did schooling uh, in barns. We did them in tents. Any place that they could make sure that the kids wouldn't be, you know, disturbed. Okay. Now, going past the Little House on the Prairie, you got into films itself. Uh-huh. And one of your first films is Maine, playing the um, great nephew of Lucille Ball's character, Peter. Right. How did that come about, and how was it working with the great Lucille Ball? That was, uh, again, most of my auditions, with a few exceptions, most of my jobs I got just going to audition, and then they continue to audition you, and then you get the part. And I got the part just through a regular audition for Maine. I love, <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. I love Lucy. I love working with Lucy. Um, Lucy, at that point, was, I don't know, she was older. Um, she had this really gravelly voice and it was like, Patrick, come here. And, you know, she would come and she was all, I, all of my scenes were with her. Uh, she always had a hand on me. She was very loving. And I knew that she was a big TV star. I just didn't understand that it was 30 years before. Cause I think we did that in like 74 and they were doing uh, maybe 20 years. They were doing, I love Lucy in the fifties. So I would watch an episode of Lucy, I Love Lucy, you know, like where she's running around stomping grapes. And then I would come in the next day and ask her about the show that was just on last night by saying, you know, I saw your TV show last. I saw your episode last night. You were really good thinking that she was doing this TV show at the same time as doing the movie. Now, I knew that she really wasn't in the TV box. I knew how you did a TV show, but I thought that that was her that this movie was like her hiatus gig and that that TV show was like her regular gig. And she was great because she would explain to me the episodes and never give away that, you know, it was 20 years before. And it was just, it was a really fun time. And I remember just because it was, I worked for like two weeks on this show and it was a lot of time just with Lucy and it was I loved her. She was really sweet to me, but I also understood that most all of the adults were afraid of her. And the reason why they were afraid of her was because she was Lucy and that they didn't want to, you know, mess up. And, but I felt kind of protected. Now, 
how do you feel about TV, straight TV movies compared to going out on the big screen? Because um, Mame, uh, only with Married Men and A Circle of Children, the first three movies besides Blazing Saddles were all TV movies. Right. Uh, to me at the time, I just noticed that like Mame was a big Warner Brothers movie that was for theaters and it took a lot of time and we really didn't do a lot per day, meaning that their schedule moved very slowly because they had a lot of money. Uh, Only with Married Men and uh, Circle of Children. Later on, I did a thing called Prince of Bel-Air. These TV movies, you just don't have as much time. So you're shooting a lot more than you would on a theatrical film. And then when you move to TV series, then you're shooting even more. So like in a movie, you might shoot two or three pages a day. In a TV movie, you might shoot five or six pages a day. In a TV show, you might shoot 10, 12 pages a day. Okay, and we'll get into the TV series in a little while. But also one of the biggest movies that you are in that still resonates to people this to this day is Summer School. And you yeah, I- played Patrick... If I'm getting this right, I, I played. I played Kevin. Hey. Kevin Winchester. Kevin Winchester. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. You were the high school football player. Yes. <laughs> I follow you on TikTok, as you know, and I saw you explain that role. How what really wasn't for you? What you wanted for? Can you explain that to our viewers now? Yeah. So. Uh, One of the, like I just mentioned, there was a TV movie that I did called Prince of Bel-Air, which starred Mark Harmon. And it was about this guy who's mid-30s. He cleans pools and he doesn't know what he's going to do in his life. And one of his clients has, uh, uh, makes him take on me, his his son. He makes, he makes Mark Harmon uh, make me his assistant. I've got to be his assistant for the summer. And it's about him growing up into a man and Mark Harmon. And Mark Harmon falls in love with uh, my cousin, who's played by Kirstie Alley. And one of the guys who works in Mark Harmon's pool shop is Dean Cameron. So in this TV movie, you've got uh, Mark Harmon, uh, Kirstie Alley, Dean Cameron, and myself. So Mark Harmon gets this job to do summer school at Paramount. And... He calls me into audition, and they want me to audition for uh, the stripper. And so uh, Larry Kazamayas, the guy who sleeps all the time. So I do the reading, and it is it goes really well. And they go, okay, listen, just as a final thing, you know, obviously we're going to have the big strip scene. Can you do like some dancing for us? And so I did my dancing. They were all excited, and they go, okay, great, you're hired. For the football player, no, you can't dance. We're not going to let you dance. <laughs> and thank God, because the guy who plays Larry Kazamayas is, you know, Ken Olin is a great, great dancer, and he did a fantastic job. But it was it was really weird. And, of course, Mark, you know, Mark brought in Kirsty and Dean and myself. I don't know exactly how much control he had over, like, what it was, because I know that Dean wanted to be in summer school. Um, but... It, it mean, it, it's weird to have so many people from one t- movie move into another and have it not be connected. I'm sure Harmon had a lot to do with that. And originally, you know, Summer School was going to be directed by Martha Coolidge, which was, you know, from Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And Dean played Spicoli on Fast Times, the TV show. And so he knew about Summer School. But then apparently Carl Reiner was supposed to do a movie for Paramount and then they backed out and Carl Reiner, Paramount said to Carl Reiner, what script do you want? Whatever script you want, then that's the one we'll give you and you can direct it. And he picked Summer School and that kind of um, kicked off Martha Coolidge. She couldn't direct it anymore. So now it was Carl Reiner and then it was going to be John Candy, but then it worked out where it was Mark Harmon. And so that's how all the craziness that goes on in Hollywood. But also, too, the four of you had the chemistry already there from the previous movie. <clears throat> right. Yeah. And and Mark had the chemistry with Mark because I didn't have any scenes with Dean so much. Uh, but Mark knew that Dean was good. And obviously, he and Kirsty had great chemistry. Kirsty had great chemistry with everybody. Kirsty was amazing. Kirsty was fantastic. Um, and so that was a that was a bunch of fun to be able to play around with those people for a summer and 
doing summer school was, I mean, there's not a bad story about it. It was like going on holiday. We went to amusement parks. We went to the beach. We hung out. It was really fun. Even to this day, if I want to like a good comedy movie, what's the one I pop on? Summer school. <laughs> it's just a good hang. It is. And then you had uh, terminal entry. Yeah. I'm not too pos too uh, well known of this one. What can you explain this one? In terminal entry was uh, back in the eighties. Basically, there were all these great movie companies like Full Moon Entertainment, Charlie Band, like low budget, you know, American Ninja, where they would do these movies that would cost you know maybe a million dollars. And then they would sell them overseas or they would sell them to Blockbuster and you could make your money back with all of the video cassette money. So there were a lot of these low budget movies being made. And this was one of those. It was a movie called Terminal Entry about they wanted to do like war games meets, you know, a war movie. And the whole idea behind it was a bunch of kids, me included, go off to this deserted or, you know, a, you know, a very, very far away cabin for a weekend of online video games, which was really weird back then. And we tapped into this video game called Terminal Entry, where you assign terrorists to, to go out and, and commit all of these terroristic acts trying to take over or destabilize the United States. Only what we didn't know was that Terminal Entry was for real. Oh no, we really you know, connected into this network of terrorists that were waiting to do these things. And so, these bunch of kids are like causing all this mayhem in the country. And there's one great line in it where it, it's one of those ADR lines that they added later where, you know, it's a newscast. And in the background of one of the scenes, you hear it and they go, billions of people are dead. And it's like billions. These kids killed billions of people with these terrorist acts. And then at the end of the movie, it's like, you know, the kids just drive off having learned their lesson. We'll never do that again. And so that was with, uh, I, I starred in that movie with Yvette Knifeer, and uh, there was, uh, uh, oh, uh, Yafit Koto was in it, Paul Smith from Midnight Express, um, Edward Albert, who was uh, like a big action guy back in the day. And it was just, it was really good for what it was, but all it was was a low budget action film. The most important thing that I remember was that we shot at the house that we were shooting it in was the same set that they used for Friday the 13th, where Jason found his mask and killed a bunch of people. And so it was like, you know, okay. oh, cool. We are <laughs> Hollywood royalty. And then your next movie, which came out in 88, was one that most people recognize you from, and that's called Heathers. Yes, that's my favorite. That's my favorite job ever, I think. Okay. What's compared to Terminal Entry and the other ones you've done up to this point? How was Heathers different than those movies? The reason Heathers was different was because from the very inception of the movie, it was weird. The guy, Daniel Waters, <clears throat> who wrote the film, he was working in a photo mat and he was writing this movie that he wanted Stanley Kubrick to direct. He wanted this to be a three hour Stanley Kubrick teenage angst drama called Heathers. And he was writing it about his sisters and her friends in this photo mat and just he's a deranged person in all the great ways. And they actually had my brother audition for the Christian Slater part. And they wanted him to come in and read. And he read the script and he goes, no, I'm not going to do it. And I go, why? And he goes, well, it's about teenage suicide. It's weird. And it's, I don't get it. He goes, will you read it and tell me, you know, what it is. So I read it and I loved it. I thought the script the script that I read was a lot longer. There was a lot more stuff in it that they just had. They couldn't shoot all of it. It was this big, huge mammoth, big thing. And I thought it was hysterical. I thought it was amazingly funny and dark. And my brother just didn't respond to the humor of it, but I did. So my brother didn't audition, but I did. And so when I went in and I auditioned for it, 
I, I even told a story like uh, that one of the guys I auditioned for, I found out later that I was auditioning with this guy. He was a good guy, but he didn't get the part. Some other guy got the part and I got the part that I got, but I was, you know, they were matching up different reads. And one of the reads I was reading with was Brad Pitt, which I never knew until later when I'm watching like the commentary on one of the DVDs that it was Brad Pitt that I read with. I remember the reading, but at the time he wasn't Brad Pitt. He was just, you know, Brad Pitt, small cap. Yeah. <clears throat> he was good and you know obviously attractive but it's like it just it didn't work for that pairing of the of the heart of ram and um and the other character uh god i'm getting too old anyway so why it was different was the the director was kurt and ram that was it kurt and ram um the director uh michael layman was coming out of film school had a real great vision Winona Ryder was coming out of Beetlejuice and really wanted to do it. Christian Slater was like going nutballs. He had just done Name of the Rose. No one knew him then, but like, you know, you can't help but like when you hit the set and everyone's looking at him going, is he doing Jack Nicholson? That's a Jack Nicholson impersonation. And he literally was. It was so weird. And what was so wonderful about it was when you do movies like this, or actually any movie, when you do a movie, you have an idea in your own head what it's going to be like. When it comes out, there's editing and music and timing and direction and other scenes that you're not in and the way that they design the movie, which, you know, like, what does it look like? How are they choosing their colors? There's so many people involved that you really don't know what it's going to be until you see it. And when I saw it, it was the, the movie that I pictured, which it was fascinating to me that it was so close to what I imagined this movie to be and what I thought my part in it would be was, was up there on screen. And I was so happy with it. I think it says a lot about different characters and different cliques and different ways that schools and kids operate with each other. Plus it wasn't afraid to be wrong. It wasn't afraid to do the dirty joke that was not, not dirty, like, you know, sexy, but just sort of like black humor that was just not appropriate. And right now, obviously, with comedies and everything, everyone's so very sensitive that I think movies like this are being found by people that can see it and go, ah, oh, that's really funny. It's a different sensibility. And that's what I loved about it. And to this day, I thought, you know, of all the things I've done, I think it's the, it's the most, the, the people took the biggest swing and they really kind of hit it out of the park. It wasn't, it's not a PC movie. No, no, not at all. And then the next movie you did in 91 is Ski School. Right. <laughs> so for me personally, it's Summer School and Ski School are the two big ones that I go to a lot just to have a laugh for the day. Ski school, yeah. I love the most. Yeah, ski school is the exact opposite of Heather's because ski school, um, I got a call from my agent saying, these people want you to be in this movie called Ski School. And I'd never been offered a movie before. I'd always had to audition. And they said, but they've got Dean Cameron. And I think they're trying to do a thing where summer school and ski school, like if we can get two people from summer school, then – that the, that halo will you know fall over onto ski school and so they go so they're offering you this part and it's going to move very very quickly but you have to go and read the script and so again no email no anything and so i had to go drive down to uh culver city to the writer's apartment where these two guys were writing the script they hadn't even finished the script yet and back in the day, they were printing up the script on that perforated paper. So I've got this script with like all of these rough edges that, you know, had just been, they'd pulled apart the perforations and I'm reading it and it's absolutely horrible. I mean, it's exactly like what you would think a ski movie would be like, you know, it's got all the boobs and all the drinking and all of the stuff that's in a ski movie, but kind of just not it didn't read funny where Heather's I totally got it. It didn't read funny, but I'd never been offered a movie before. And we were going to be shooting up in Vancouver. I'd never been to Vancouver and I love Dean and Dean and I, and I'd love to do a movie with Dean again. 
So I said yes. I mean, it's not like it's a big thing for me to like do a bad movie. I've done plenty of bad movies, but thinking about it and like you know like hmm, what would my character be? That's not ski school. So the even a longer part of this story is so I, I agree to do the movie and then I get contacted by the production company and they send me up to Vancouver and I'm in Vancouver and I, I have to call my agents because you have to sign up for like their acting union up in, in Canada. And I'm calling my agents and I, I talk to them and I say, hey, listen, about this contract. They go, don't worry about the contract. We're having an argument with them. But, you know, it's not like you're in Canada. And it's like, I was in Canada. They didn't know that I had gone to Canada. They didn't know that we were like shooting the next morning. They were just sort of like, I said, no, I'm in Canada. They go, you're in Canada? And they go, you got to come back. And go, I'm not coming back. I'm only here. We're going to do the movie. And so it was like this weird thing where it was just sort of like it was moving so quickly. And the way that they were doing it was, again, it was a low-budget movie. But they had Dean and they had the amazing Stuart Fratkin, who I absolutely love. Uh, Mark Thomas Miller, who became a friend, we were in Groundlings together years later, played Reed Jansen. He was a dick and he was awesome. And they had myself and I was just writing movies. I still write movies, but I was in, you know, I was writing then. And they just had all of this, these guys that were throwing in all these lines and all these ideas, you know, uh, all the Shakespeare, helium Shakespeare and whose line, whose panties are these and the Lombada and all of the stuff that was kind of like weird was all stuff that Dean and Stuart and I came up with. And, um, you know, setting shit on fire while we're trying to talk to each other. All the things that I think make Ski School kind of a fun watch, it's fun because it wasn't planned out. It was just sort of like, oh, it'd be funny if we did this. And then it happened to be funny. It's not like I look at myself going, oh, yes, I'm a, a tour, and I know exactly how to touch, you know, the humor bone. No, it was just a bunch of dudes coming up with stupid stuff to, to say. And, you know, Dean and Stuart came up with the whole high, like no high fives. You couldn't high five each other. You could only touch each other and, and wave to each other. It was just, you know, just a, a blast. And of course we're in Vancouver and it wasn't getting dark until 10 at night. And so we'd have these long shooting days and I didn't know how to ski. I'd lied to them about knowing how to ski. So when on my first day, when I get up there, I didn't even know how to get on or off a ski lift. And so I had to come, like I had to be honest and say, yeah, I don't actually know how to ski. So the director had to ski me around to all the different locations while I, on his back while, <laughs> while we shot. So basically you did a lot of ad lib for ski school. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, there's the I mo I'd say 80% of that movie was made up while we were there. I think that's what a lot of the modern movies are missing is the comedian comedian side ad lib to a movie. Yeah, and I I think for comedy specifically why it works in a movie like that is if you have the specific um characters the or or are personalities of, of Stuart and Dean and myself that on the day in the moment you can come up with something that's funny that when you're sitting down in a apartment in Culver City trying to come up with what's funny in 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 the snow you come up with structural stuff oh we'll have a snowball fight or uh, they win the big race but in the moment like on movies like that it really can be a lot better if you're more spontaneous. So the next movie was a direct to video was ghouls three ghouls go to college. Yeah. Ghoulies go to college. Exactly. How did that come about for you? That was a long audition process. Surprisingly, it was a company called Vestron, which was another one of those 1980s video tape, like, they had made a lot of money in selling videotapes and selling the movies on videotapes. And so obviously Ghoulies 3 is the third movie in the Ghoulies franchise. Um, I thought it was the most well-produced movie and the best one, but it wasn't the most popular. Um, it was a straight up animal house meets Ghoulies. I mean, there's no way around it. it that's the, the pitch. John Carl Beekler directed it. Who's a famous legendary makeup guy who, I thought was a dynamic, great director. 
We had Eva LaRue, who would later become this huge soap opera star. We had Jason Scott Lee, who would become like Bruce Lee and Rapa Nui and Jungle Book. And we had this kid, Matthew Lillard, who was an extra, who would become Matthew Lillard from Scream and all these other great movies. Uh, and going back to when I was talking about my, my parents, my dad had an agency. And Matthew Lillard was an extra, but he was doing all this funny stuff. And so myself and one of the other guys, Evan, went to the producers and said, can't we Taft Hartley, Matt? He's really funny. Why don't we add him? And so Matt and I became friends, and I had my dad sign him to the agency. And my dad got him a show on MTV called Skate TV, which was like back in the day like about skateboarders. And then my dad took him aside and said, okay, look, you got to get yourself a real agent. I'm not a real agent. You're really, really talented. You're going to go places, kid. And so he helped him find an agency. And of course, Matt Lillard is this huge talent. But that was one of those movies where it was like we had all of these great people in it. Um, we had a little bit more money than these other movies. And we shot it. And I thought it was really, I thought it was going to be, I don't know, what would be a good example? I thought it was going to be like, not like a, a, a Friday the 13th, because it was definitely a comedy, but like a Gremlins. I didn't think it would be as big as Gremlins, but I thought that everyone would look at it and go, oh, that's a pretty good you know, version of that. Pretty funny movie. And it just, I don't think it ever got released. And then it got released on video, but it was supposed to be in theaters. And then it just sort of died, which is fine. It happens. But if you're interested, I thought it was a pretty good movie. And then the next movie came out in 92 that I can remember as a kid. Mind you, I was only born in 79. So it, it, this is right in my avenue of growing up. Yeah. It's Three Ninjas. Yeah, like Three Fester. Ninjas. Yeah. I love Three Ninjas, man. I thought uh, when I auditioned again, it was just a straight regular audition. Uh, it was called Ninja Kids. And I understood the assignment that these guys were supposed to be non-threatening threats. You couldn't be afraid of them because they're little kids. You want the whole movie is about is for nine to twelve year olds watching these kids be heroes. So you wanted to be threatening without being scary. So the whole idea of the surfers came about. And again, a young director, John Turtletop, who's now a huge director from the Meg and national treasure um he was just i thought a, a great director i thought he directed it great and i think you if you watch the first one versus the next three the first one is the best one yes um, i'll agree and, with you on that yeah and it's like it's because of john john did a great job and the kids were great i loved working with the two guys that played the surfers um the guy who played hammer he was a last minute replacement there was not supposed to be there was supposed to be another actor playing Hammer who quit because he thought he was going to be play, playing Fester. And when he found out I was playing Fester, he quit. And the guy who ended up playing Hammer, the one, the other surfer guy that talks, he, he was our second assistant cameraman. And they were looking around that day going, what are we going to do? The guy quit and walked off the set. And they go, we don't have a guy. And, he, and, and DJ is his name, DJ Harder. He goes, I think I can do it. And he did. He did a great job. And you can't tell that he wasn't an actor. No, he got some of the best lines in the movie because he they, he made them the best lines in the movie. He was so and good. I, and again, the times have changed, but at one point in the movie, you're standing there with two pistols in the front of a little child pointing right. at the kids. <laughs> I'm like, because I saw your TikTok about it, and I'm like, I totally missed that part. Yeah, I had three guns. Now, the guns, just so anyone's not worried, the guns were real firearms, but there were no bullets. There was never any bullets on the set. We checked them before you shoot. You look in the chamber. There's no wads, which are like fake bullets. We had wads and stuff in Heathers because I get shot, which is a whole other thing. But in this in this movie, no, there was no ammunition in it. Uh, but still, I mean, they're, they're not little rubber guns, and I had three of them in front of this poor little girl's face. It's like <laughs> different times, different times. And again, like you said, that was the best one out of the three. And I agree 100%. And I can sit there and watch that. I have an eight-year-old stepson. I turn says, here, sit down and watch with me. Watch a good movie. And I put that on and he's like, oh, that's funny. Yeah. So the kids nowadays can sit there and watch it. And it's a wholesome movie. 
Yeah, if if wholesome is beating up people and kicking them in the crotch and, <laughs> and giving them also, poop kids, juice, they, do, they put their minds to something they can sit there and do whatever they want. Right. And that's basically the start of a good family movie like that. No, we really, have, I really enjoyed that movie. Again, it was that was a surprise because. It was a low budget movie that no one expected would do anything because it wasn't it wasn't done by a major motion picture studio. But when they finished it, Disney bought it, and then when Disney bought it, it became you know three ninjas and not ninja kids. And they had that poster, which is you know that and um, the the Tom Cruise movie Days of Thunder. That orange color, I, I think, is why it became so popular. It's so easy to spot. I really think that that's one of the reasons why I got rented so much. I think that's a lot of things with any of the movies. If the poster itself stands out, more people are going to tune into seeing that than another right. name. So, yeah, I mean, any any type of you know crime thriller back in the day, there there was two columns. It was a white box. You had like you know. It, ruthless intentions, you know, and then like three people staring at you. It's like, that's, that was all the same type of movie. And then you got three ninjas that's the burning a hole in your retina with the color orange. <laughs> You're going to recognize it. So since then you had a few other movies, but your last one was 2008 called rent adult uh, elf. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, how that one sounds really f funny to me. I'm sorry I didn't see that one, but explain that one to me. Okay, so Ren and Elf actually, to be honest, it's actually kind of sweet. It's one of those uh, the Christmas movie mills that they did, where they do a thousand Christmas movies, you know, for Hallmark and for Great American Family. And I had done a movie back in uh, 2012 called 2012 Ice Age with a company called The Asylum. And The Asylum is famous for making Sharknado and Transmorphers and, you know, Titanic 2. Um, and what they do is they're a bunch of great guys. I love these guys. And they make these low-budget movies. And it's not like the 80s where they have a big area where they can sell them. They're very, very specific about digital releases and everything. And part of their business is to make movies for other people. So like Hallmark says, we want you guys to make a Christmas movie. So the Asylum made Rent an Elf, which I thought was a really sweet story about this girl who uh, is like this party planner. And she meets a guy and she, they fall in love and it's all about Christmas. And I played her, her dad. And so I get a call from the guys over at the Asylum saying, hey, can you do two days on this movie? And I went up to, you know, up to the mountains where they were shooting and we did it. I've done a number of movies with these guys. I've, in fact, this last year I did, let's see, I did uh, doomsday meteor, Arctic Armageddon, um, 12 games of Christmas, uh, attack of the meth gator. Um, and these were all for the asylum. And on those movies that I just told you about, I mean, we're talking, we, we shot, Arctic Armageddon and uh, Doomsday Meteor in five days. And I shot my part in 12 hours. And that's like 30. Remember we were talking about page count? Yes. Uh, in an Asylum movie, we did 30 pages a day. And so that's, you're not, you're, you're barely, it's, it's like if you were to read through it out loud, it would take you almost that long. So it's, it's a really fast moving set. And again, I love those guys. And, you know, it's, it's a way to keep doing work and, and get out there without having to have the whole long process of, you know, these big movies can take a long time. Now, also, too, I forgot to mention, you're also a voice actor. Yes, sir. You did, um, back in 91, you did uh, Adventures in Dinosaur City. You played Rex, Mr. Big, which is right. a voice acting for you. That was really fun because I got to play the good guy and the bad guy of the same movie. And they're both dinosaurs. It's about these kids that get sucked into a dinosaur world. And there are anthropomorphic dinosaurs. And there's Rex, who's the hero. And Mr. Big is the bad guy. 
and at the end they fight and so I, I got the chance to voice these characters and one of the guys sounds like me and the other guy sounds like boy mr big and i'm going to tell you and it's like you just do these great voices and then you get to watch it with all this other puppetry and it was pretty cool and now let's get into the tv side of your career okay. your first show was this is the life where you had one episode you played right how was it going well this is so this is before you got into the little house on the prairie yeah this is your life was a christian tv show that they did back in the 70s where it was they did a lot of them and so i think i did a number actually more than one my, i know my brother did more than one um and they were just little not fairy tales fables where you know they would tell a good moralistic story and they were shown on tv and it was just like it wasn't a big network thing but it was a a good story and they had really good parts for kids and so we were always auditioning for them okay and then again you had two other episodes or one was a mini series uh called captains and the king right that, and that was, was a mini series that you had right a tv show about like a guy coming over from europe at the turn of the century to make himself something and i played uh, him as a kid um, and those were big back in those days it was called you know a, a, a television novel or a, a, a mini series where they would do a little small number of episodes but it was all just telling one story all right and then after that was the little house on the prairie but also right. too, at the same time you were actually in a guest star in other episodes of tv shows um the love love boat uh trapper john md again the love boat 21 jump street and then you have paradise mm -hmm. and then you did a from 95 to 98 you actually were the voice of flash thompson in spider-man yeah that was cool so again here's a prime example you you're an actor and now you're behind a screen doing the acting role of well the voice of an actor of a character yeah, exactly. i mean it was it was a blast because i got to work with mark hamill who was playing the hobgoblin i got to work with ed asner um i got to work with just all these wonderful voiceover people that i had admired and i was a huge spider-man fan I, I i to this day in back of those doors is a big collection of spider-man comics and uh, so it was a big thrill to be a part of that. And then to recently kind of, they kind of like backdoored that series into one of the universes in the Spider-Verse. So basically I get to say I'm in the MCU now. <laughs> <laughs> and then from there, it. Oh yeah. And then from there, you've also had a couple of other ends. But then in 95 to 2005 is one show that most people recognize, and that is called JAG. Yes, Judge sir. Advocate General, and you played Lieutenant Bud Roberts Jr. Yeah. Yeah, I love JAG, obviously, for a lot of reasons. One, it was the, the biggest show, biggest project in my career. I met my wife there. She was a producer on the show, Tina Albanese. Uh, we had our baby, Joe, um, while we were doing that show. Um, a lot of the things that happened to Bud happened to me in real life. Like when we were, when Bud got married, I got married about a month later uh, when we had our first baby on the show. We had our first baby in real life. I did, I still have both my legs. So that did not happen. <laughs> but a lot of people didn't know that. A lot of people thought that maybe I'd lost my legs. But there was an episode where I get hit in the face by Brumby and Harm and I had to wear braces. My, 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 mouth was wired shut for a while while that's because i actually had braces and they wrote it into the show so it was a big big part of my life and what was it like working with those two people the most Catherine bell and um mark harm uh, it was actually uh, uh uh not mark Harmon. he's on ncis it was with uh david james elliott and that's david his no. character was Mark. Yeah, the, you know, I got Mark Mark Harmon that job. 
that's the whole thing. I was the one that told Don Belisario about Mark Harmon, but no one knows that. Um, I did a video on it. Hopefully it gets around to Mark. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, David, what I liked about David is on the very last episode, he did 224 episodes. I think I did 200 and some. He His script was still marked up. He cared. He really worked hard. He really did a good job. And I got to respect that. He's also a funny guy. He's a, he's a good guy to be around. But when you are the lead of a TV show, you don't understand as how much pressure is on that. Every person you interact with, every person that is above you, every person that is below you on the you know org chart relies on you being a star so the show can continue. Okay, And so David had all this huge pressure, and he handled it, I thought, really well. Catherine was just like, she was like a sister in that she was always sweet. She was funny, incredibly, insanely beautiful. I was like, I spent my 10 years there about three feet away from both of them for most every shot. And you just look over at Catherine and go, there's like not a blemish on her. She's perfect. And she was really sweet. Um, but again, you know, th those are the personalities, but you've got a whole crew of people that you're working with that is like whenever you go to work, whatever job you do, there are the people that are close to your desk or in your group that you work with, and then there's all these other people. And it, at some point it becomes, it is a job, and we were there for 10 years. So all of the special moments that get distilled and compressed and, and put to music and given special effects and then promoted and made sure that everybody looks pretty, when you guys are watching this one little episode, it's just 10 days out of our life where we're doing these different scenes. And so I can turn on these episodes and I can remember what I did in each scene as far as like what was going on in my life. Like, oh, that's the day that, you know, I went to Pottery Barn to pick up the chairs that my wife had ordered because I was right near this location. And I remember that. But I won't remember <laughs> what happens in the episode. I won't remember what happens in the story because that's kind of like a different part of my life. It's like, uh, that's the pretend part. The real parts I remember, but the pretend part kind of just fades away. So sometimes I can watch, same with Little House, I can watch an episode and have no idea of what my character is going to do next. But then as I'm saying the lines and I'm watching it, I remember doing it, but I don't know what's going to happen next. It's, it's a weird combination. And then you also mentioned that the Admiral that they brought in you knew beforehand? The uh, no, I'd never met John Jackson before. But he had been in uh, A Few Good Men. He played the same, basically the same character. And I thought he was fantastic. And i he's one of my favorite people from the show. I love John. John and his wife, Jana, are just the best. His son was a Major League Baseball player for the Diamondbacks. I mean, he played, you know, uh, not John Connor, um, uh, John Connor Jackson. Connor Jackson was, you know, that's his son, and and that was so exciting uh, for him and for us actually. But he's a great guy. He's a great family. And Jag was actually one of the uh, TV shows that me and my mom would sit and watch constantly. You and your mom? Oh, that's awesome. Usually, it's that it's usually it's a dude it. and his dad or his grandpa would watch Jag. Or you would watch Little House with your mom. So that, that you watch uh, Jag with your mom is fun. I like that. And that also leads into the other series that we just mentioned before, NCIS. Right. Yeah, NCIS is dynamite. I wish that we were able to have gone as long as NCIS is still going. I would have done Jag until it was a half-hour situation comedy if, I, if, if left to its own devices. But, again, you... You actually have had guest roles on NCIS, mm -hmm. and this time you're now a captain. Like towards the end of your reoccurring roles, you're now a captain instead of a lieutenant, right? Which, which is, is so weird because here I am. I've never served a day in, in in any service. Have great respect for anyone who has, but obviously I never put in the work that needs to be. Nor am I go to OCS or anything. So. The fact that I found out that I was going to be a captain or that Bud was going to be a captain and the fact that I was kind of proud just is kind of sick. It's like, 
what am I proud about? I didn't do anything, but I was so excited. So excited that Bud got promoted. And the NCIS, yes, you've had some uh, characters leave the show for different reasons, but all in all, it's still considered a family environment. Well, yeah, for NCIS, what's really weird is we shot JAG for 10 years. NCIS, we, we were shooting in Valencia originally. Originally, we shot at Paramount for the first year. Then we moved to Valencia. And the stages that we used in Valencia, there was like a, 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 a commercial park, you know, where they have all these different buildings. We were in one building, which we made one of the warehouses our stage. And then the next building across from us, across this little alleyway, was where they were shooting Mighty Morphing Power Rangers for all of the 90s. And so we would walk outside. Yeah, we would walk outside and we see all these Mighty Morphing Power Ranger like monsters just kind of around. We would roll our eyes. And so when they finished shooting there, then they put NCIS in those stages. So NCIS, when JAG finished, had those stages. And then they also took over the stages that we shot JAG at. And the weird thing about JAG is JAG built a bunch of ship sets and military sets that they still have there. So when I've gone back and I've done jobs on NCIS, I'm literally shooting like atom for atom the same set that I shot JAG on. Just it, it's been painted or it's been changed a little bit. And it's the exact same crew. The camera guy, Billy Webb. Uh, of the crew, the gaffers, the grips, the drivers, our head of transportation, the producers, everybody are the same folks from JAG. So it's like coming back to a place that you know everybody. And it's a blast whenever I get it's to do like that. It's like going home. Yeah, it kind of was. I mean, look, 10 years is 10 years. That's a long time anywhere. Yeah. And, you know, it's it, it's amazing to see the longevity of NCIS. And it just keeps going stronger. And it, what amazes me is when, when you go back and it's the same place. It's like going back. It's like if you go to school um, and, you know, you get out of school, you go to college, you get a job, and then your job is to go back and your office is your elementary school. It's like it's weird. It's just like you're sitting in the same place but doing a completely different thing. So you've done a couple other guest spots on the shows recently, but also too, you're an executive producer. Yes. What's the, how is it transfer? What's the word am I looking for? The transformation going from actor to executive producer. How is that for you? It's not as far as you think. It's not such a big difference as you think, mainly because as an actor, you have to take a bunch of different ideas and different inputs from the director, from the writer, from the makeup, from the wardrobe, and then you're given all these things and you need to create a performance, right? So you're kind of filtering things so that your performance is based on what was it, what was said in the script. The director wants this type of emotion. What did they put me into where? What does my makeup look like? And an executive producer is just a bigger filter. The EP job, again, Tina and I, Tina, who I met on JAG, we got married and we created this show called Sea Dad Run. We wrote it, we sold it, and it's about a TV dad who's America's number one dad for 10 years. His show ends. He goes back home thinking that he's going to be with his family, but then his wife finds out that she's also an actress, finds out that she, when, when the husband went away to do the TV show, her character on her soap opera was put into a coma. And so now that the husband's home with the kids, her character now wakes up. And so she's going back to work on the soap opera. So now dad is left home alone. And he thinks he's, it's going to be great because he's been a TV dad for 10 years. And he and his writer know exactly how to be dads, but they've never been dads for real, like on the front lines with making lunches and doing all this stuff. And so hilarity ensues that, you know, he, 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 he tries to be a dad like he was on TV and that starred Scott Baio and Mark, uh, Mark Curry and Alana Ubach and, and Rami, Ma not Rami Malik, uh, Rami, Rami Youssef, Rami Youssef played one of our guys. And as an executive producer, we, my wife and I, she was also co-executive producer. 
we wrote the script so we knew what we wanted. And so then you become this giant filter. So it's the same thing where now props is coming to you and the writers and the actors and the directors and everyone in the network, they're all coming to you saying, well, what do we do here? What about this? How do you want this? Where do you want that? The editors are like, what jokes should we keep? What jokes should we cut? Not that you're the know-it-all, but as the job, you're like a filter. You filter things out. What would be good for the show? Well, we need to make the set look like this because then, because I've spoken to the writers and the writers know that they want to do this, so the set has to feel like that. So you basically filter everything through you, and then that, as an executive producer, that's your input into the show. You are kind of like putting together all of the different ingredients to make the eventual episode. So the transformation is just an expansion of this filtering thing that happens when you're an actor. Okay. And how many actual shows have you been executive producer besides that one? Oh, just that, just that series. But we did 70, 65, some 53. I think we did 53 episodes. We did three years of that. And I've also been, look, I've been a producer on different things as far as like, I, I wrote a movie called Hollywood Palms. That I was a producer on um, National Lampoon's Last Resort. Again, I was a producer on that. But it was like, it's not anything like being the EP. The EP, especially in television, when you're the writer EP, you're kind of the big, you're just the big filter. You're just the one that knows how the show should run. Not that you're the best one. You always want people to come in with better jokes than you, but that you're the one that figures out what gets to go in. And now you also run your own acting school. Yes, <laughs> How is that, starting up the acting school, how is that compared to everything else you've done up to this point? It's actually been amazing. I, you know, I started it during COVID when, you know, I couldn't go anywhere, couldn't do anything. And so we teach everything to this day. Everything is done online through Zoom. Um, and I'm really surprised at that technology of how good it allows you to work with people. And I've worked with everyone from kids to adults. And the idea behind it was, I like to call the, I've went to a thousand different acting classes and, and there's a type of acting class that I call a studio acting class where it's in a small dark room or a small dark theater. And everyone is concerned about the interior motives of a character and the actor. It's very quiet. It's very introspective. It's very theoretical and it's so wonderful for an actor, but it has absolutely nothing to do with like what it's like on a set. A set is, you know, like what I, working actor school is the name of it because, okay, so you've got your big speech. You auditioned with it. You haven't met the star of the show, but they're going to be coming out soon. And because of the way the lighting, we're coming up at the end of the day. We're only going to have 20 minutes to shoot it. We're going to shoot his coverage first, but you're going to be the last shot because you're standing in front of the sun. So you only have one shot at it. It's a page of dialogue. Okay, go action. That is so not like an acting class of the studio kind where everything is slow and quiet and calm. It's very, very different. And so what I like to do is walk people through what the real life experience is of being a working actor. How do you manage your emotions? How do you manage your time on a set? How do you manage your time and emotions and your, and your emotional cadence? during a day so that when you're finally in front of a camera and you only have two minutes to get that performance, how do you, how are you ready for that? And so that was the guiding light behind it as far as like, I can share these experiences that I had with young actors, or when I say young, I mean new, you can be any age, but maybe you're just starting off and you haven't had the experience of being in front of a camera. And then because of COVID and just, you know, not being able to go anywhere, I started doing it online and found that, oh, this is really great and came up with the idea, look, you know, you can train in Hollywood without having to go to Hollywood. You know, I've got people in one class. I have people from uh, Connecticut to San Diego and, you know, there's even from Colorado. So literally three different time periods all happening in one class and it's intimate and involved like a studio class, but you're learning the, you know, like how to be, how to be a construction worker of a movie, you know, how to put together a movie like you would in real life. So you're basically taking all your experience from being a child actor right up to now, all into one 
class per se and yep. saying, all right, this is what you should be expecting as an actor. Right, because there are so many misconceptions about what acting is on a set and how a set works and what you can do and how things are done. I was actually kind of surprised that so many people, I did a TikTok on Love Boat, and I was surprised at how many people thought that it was actually shot on a real boat, where if you look at Love Boat, in my eyes, it's about the fakest looking boat you can ever imagine, but because they they shot some episodes on a real boat, like maybe 10 out of their whole se series, and then intercut pictures of like, oh, the boat's on the ocean, and then we cut to Julie McCoy. That you it makes you feel, but these are the the you know the realities that we talk about in in the classes, and you can find out whatever you you know more information classes. We always have new classes starting, and it's at workingactorschool.com. Real simple, or drop me a line at workingactorschool at gmail.com. What we'll do is uh, when this gets posted on TikTok, we'll have that link in the bio. Oh, sweet! Thank you. Even when we put it up on our social medias, uh, like Facebook, it'll definitely be up there. Oh, cool. So besides that, what else do you have coming up that you would love our audience to know about? <laughs> um, there's a lot of stuff that's going on on the writing aspect that I've written a couple of things that because of the writer strike last year uh, had to stop down. I've got a new TV show that I'm beginning to pitch, which I'm really excited by, and I can only say that much about it. But, you know, it, it starts a long process where it's a show like See Dad Run and that it would be for younger viewers. It's a comedy, and it would be something that I would be running and shooting and doing all the things that I did with, with See Dad Run. And so basically I've been writing, and a lot of the things that I'm doing now will take a while before anything happens. I think the next thing to come out uh, that I'm in is a thing called Attack of the Meth Gator. <laughs> and that's another one of those, you know, asylum movies that is just exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> and you brought up the of course, writer's TikTok. strike. I do the TikToks every day. So if you know, I'm, yes. I'm always doing those. Yeah. And I love them. I love listening oh, to you. the stories from you. Um, are the different shows or movies that you were in and, the stories behind them. Yeah, I think that that's, I mean, what's fun for me is one, once I realized that something that seems not boring, but something that seems like not interesting to me could be interesting to people who'd never heard of it. Um, then I realized that, oh, they're, then they're, I can tell a lot of stories. I, I always thought that it was just interactions with, you know, big, celebrities that people enjoyed hearing about, which is true, but, you know, insights into how things are shot and uh, insights into what things are really like, again, kind of like working after school, but like on a, on a more storytelling basis, people right. really enjoy. And I, and that makes me excited. And don't, don't stop doing your TikToks, please. Thank you. <laughs> because when I have a bad day, I go right to your TikToks. It's like, ah, okay, I enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> but so you did mention the working uh, actor schools contact I know a lot of celebrities go to conventions for autograph signings do you do any of that stuff oh absolutely I love conventions I was going to conventions as a, a comic book fan long before anyone wanted me as a guest and if anyone wants me as a guest you know reach out at workingactorschool.com I love going. I love talking to people. And I have a, I also bring money because I always end up buying a lot of stuff at these conventions. Have um, you ever just, done any on the East Coast? Yeah, I was there. I, I've been trying to get back. I went to Chiller about 10 years ago or so, and I loved it. I thought it was great. When we, we're done, we'll talk. Okay. <laughs> because that's literally, I'm in Jersey. That's in New York. Yeah. I mean, it's in, what was it? Uh, Passaic? No. Um, no. Um, not Paramus. Well, sh Paramus is not too far away, and so is Passaic. Yeah. Um, Chiller's in um, oh, New York. Um, I think it was Beth Page. Parsimony. It was in Parsimony, Jersey. Parsimony. 
Precipity. That's where the one I went to was in. That was a while ago. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, and I do. I did a bunch of stuff with the Little House conventions through the Midwest. I ended up not having. Uh, I didn't really respect the promoter that I was working with. And so we, we parted ways, but yeah, I'm, I'm always looking to go to these conventions. I think they're really, really fun. Right. Okay. So you remember that was at the Sheridan. Um, yeah. Yeah. They actually moved it to the Hilton now. Okay. A bigger hotel. That was a pretty small s setup they had there. Not because yeah. it was the hotel was small, but so many people showed up. You're right. Um, when I went, <laughs> The funniest part is I actually met the cast of um, Revenge of the Nerds. Oh, cool. And one of the guests that they brought in was Melissa Gilbert and her husband, Timothy. Oh, right. Of course. And so Ted, was, he, Ted McGinn, was Ted McGinley in Revenge of the Nerds? Yes. Yeah. And so Ted is a good friend of ours from Sea Dad Run. He played, he played on our show, and he's, he's a great guy. And when I turned around and told them, I was like, yeah, I watched that movie at 10 years old. They're like, what? I was like, yeah. <laughs> My parents didn't think anything wrong of it. They're like, you got cool parents. <laughs> yeah, and now it's apparently a crime against humanity. <laughs> I'll still watch it to this day. <laughs> but I'm actually out of questions for you right now. Okay. Do you have anything you would like to ask us as the network? Uh, I'm I'm just glad that you are having me on. Thanks and thanks for your patience for setting this up, and I'm glad that we got a chance to talk. Yes, and again, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you're out on the West Coast, and it's like now four o'clock. Yeah, it's real early for me. Later for you. Yeah, but <laughs> again, like I said, we work around everybody's schedule. So again, thank you, and folks. As you heard, you can find them on all these different movies, the TV shows. Check out workingactorschool.com. You want to get into acting or learn how, there's your gentleman that will teach you. So, again. Thank you very much, Carl, man. That's nice. Again, I'm Carl. And for Patrick, this is the AGT Network. And we'll catch you all on the flip side. I, I love modern technology here. <laughs>